Last night we were studying the book of Acts and George asked a question about why it is that Paul shaved his head. And actually the passage says that Paul cut his hair. And when I went to look this up, look up the origin word, it's shorn or shear or cut his hair. So it's a little bit different from shaving your head. I just want to make sure that I make that point. And it says that Paul did this in reference to a vow. Let's first look this up in, I want to look up that con the context of that word, shorn or cut his hair, so that I can show you that there's a difference between shaving and shearing or cutting his hair. Uh, the context is in eight, Acts 18.18, 18, and in the King James it says, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then he took his, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Achilla, having shorn his head in Sencrea, for he had a vow. Okay, the context is having shorn. It is Strong's G2751. The word is Cairo. And it says, in the outline of biblical usage, it says to shear a sheep, to get or be let be shorn of shearing or cutting short the hair of the head. And the place that, of course, is most important is how did God use it in a sentence? Okay, so there's three contexts. Acts 832, the place of the scripture, which, re which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. Acts 18.18, 18, which is the context we're, we are studying. And Paul, after this, tarried yet a good while and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Achilla, having shorn his head in Sencrea, for he had taken a vow. And then 1 Corinthians 11.6 for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Okay, the outline of biblical usage tells us in this specific sentence, in this specific passage, that this word being used, Cairo, for, for shorn is not the same as shaven. Otherwise, it wouldn't say it is if it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven. It would just say for a woman to be shorn, and that would be enough to help us to understand either that her hair was either cut short or, or shaven. Okay, so it's being set as separate from shaven. I just think that's important because it seemed to me, I, I did Google to see if there were any scriptural con, uh, contexts or scriptural like verses cited that would help me to understand what this context means. And in the process of Googling, I found a lot of, you know, people need to get comfortable with like not knowing until God reveals to you. It doesn't do any good for us to be, it, you know, last night when George asked me the question, I said, this is the scripture that comes to mind for me. But to be honest, I don't actually know. It's okay not to know until you know, until God reveals it to you. The problem is when people set themselves up as experts in the world, they feel that they need to give an answer, and that doesn't really work for serving God, because he'll test you on that to see if that's actually your heart or if you're going to if you're going to have the humility to say, "You know what? I don't know." And then to go later and try to research it like I did. Well, I didn't find anything useful on Google, surprise surprise, but I will tell you what I did see and so in part, what I want to do in this video is to debunk what most people are saying, at least according to Google. And what they're saying is that Paul, it seems like Paul took a Nazarite vow. Well, I know the word. The word does not talk about shaving your head to take a Nazarite vow. Let's read it. Numbers chapter six, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite, they must abstain from wine and other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. They must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as they remain under their Nazarite vow, they must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the, skin, the seeds or skins. During the entire period of their Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. 
Okay, so this is what, you know, raised a red flag for me because I know that. I know that they have to grow their, they, they grow their hair out and they do not cut their hair until the end of their vow, then they shave what was dedicated to the Lord. So let's, let's continue on. During the entire period of their Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. They may, must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. They must let their hair grow long. Throughout the period of their dedication to the Lord, the Nazarite must not go near a dead body. Now, this is the game changer right here, because technically we might say, oh, well, it was the at the end of his vow that he shaved his head, uh, you know, once his hair had grown long. Well, first of all, the scriptures don't tell us that. And if that's what God wanted us to believe, he'd make it clear. No indication that this is what was going on with Paul, that he was dedicating himself as a Nazarite. But in another couple chapters in, so from Acts 18 to Acts 20, Paul is raising somebody from the dead. He's raising Eutychus from the dead at Troas. And he's laying on the body and, you know, doing all this. If he were a Nazarite, he would know that he wasn't allowed to do that. He wasn't allowed to be around a dead body because we just read it here. Throughout the period of their dedication to the Lord, the Nazarite must not go near a dead body. Well, he's laying on the dead body. Even if their own father or mother or brother or sister dies, they must not make themselves ceremonially unclean on account of them because the symbol of their dedication to God is on their head. Throughout the period of their dedication, they are consecrated to the Lord. So this is, you know, the fact that this is the number one argument on Google uh, and several sermons reiterate this lie tells me like these people are not even reading the word. They're probably getting that from a commentary or they make these things up by the delusions of their own mind. I mean, this is not a love for God. If you're, if you don't have the time to lean in and actually receive the answer, you shouldn't be giving an answer. If someone dies suddenly in the Nazarite's presence, thus defiling the hair that symbolizes their dedication they must shave their head on the seventh day, the day of their cleansing. Then on the eighth day, they must bring two doves or two young pigeons to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Okay, so no indication that Paul was distressed about that. No indication that he felt that he had defiled himself by being around that dead. But no indication of any of that. No one should be adding to the story. No one should add to the scroll. The priest is to offer... One as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering to make atonement for the Nazarite because they sinned by being in the presence of the dead body. That same day they are to consecrate their head again. They must rededicate themselves to the Lord for the same period of dedication and must bring a year old lamb as a guilt offering. The previous days do not count because they became defiled during their period of dedication. Okay, so the other thing that I want to point out here is that this is specifically talking about shaving your head not the context that we read of that Greek word Cairo, meaning to shear or cut your hair short. It's a different context. So we have those two points right there. I just want to make sure that this lie is debunked so that no one is deceived by it. Now let's go back to Acts 18 and read the context in question. Verse 18, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had cut his hair, had his hair cut off at the Sancria because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Okay, that's it. That's, that's the context. Now let's go to Acts 21. Verse 23. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food, sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. At the beginning of the context, in verse 23, you see that they've made a vow. 
And then they're going to, actually the context here is shave your head. In verse 18, we see that there's an association between a vow and shearing your head or cutting your hair short. And here in 21, there's a context between these men who are shaving their head in reference to a vow. So there's definitely an association with the vow and either shaving or shearing your head. Now, I want to make one thing clear. As we're doing this study, I can't tell you 100% what the why it is that they're doing this or what exactly they're doing and the reason I can't tell you that is because it's not information that God gave us so if it's not information that he gave us like in his law he made it clear that hey when you make a vow you are to shave your head which he didn't I looked through it if I missed it let me know but I didn't see it in the law what I do see in the book of acts is that there is an association between these things and it also reminds me of other things that are in God's law with regard to, for example, if a woman was being held captive. So let's see, Deuteronomy 21.10. When you go to war against your enemies and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands and you take captives, if you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and are attracted to her, you may take her as your wife, bring her into your home and have her shave her head, trim her nails, and put aside the clothes she was wearing when captured. After she's lived in your house and warned her father and mother for a full month, then you may go to her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. If you're not pleased with her, let her go wherever she wishes. You must not sell her or treat her as a slave since you have dishonored her. Okay, so I know this context. I also know in Leviticus that if you had like a defiling disease and you were purifying yourself, that you were to shave your head, your eyebrows, and any facial hair. There's a symbolism here of letting go of the old and bringing in the new, like shaving off the old and bringing in the new, starting something over. And so in that symbolism of shaving or shearing, if we understand that within the context of making a vow of purification rites, then we would, then uh, that fits, like that is understandable. And it is indeed, it's not something that we're adding or something we're making up. It's something that God has already established. So we have some sort of understanding as to why Paul would have done this. And we also have the association in Acts 21, in which these men, this group of men are making a vow. Then they participate in purification rites and they shave their head. Now, I, I think that this requires us to step into the situation as well. If you're making a vow, usually you would be saying, I'm not going to do this thing anymore. I'm going to start doing this thing. Or you might, maybe you weren't doing, there isn't something that you're abandoning. You're just doing a new thing. From this point forward, this is what I'm going to do. So you have that theme of starting something new. And even in the absence of there being some other behavior that you're discontinuing, there's still a letting go of the void of having, of, of, of having participated in this particular behavior. I'm going to use something very arbitrary. From this point forward, I'm going to bake you a cake every single day. Right, so you weren't baking cakes previously, or I wasn't baking cakes previously. And I'm letting go of the void of not having baked cakes previously. And I'm starting this new behavior that I'm going to participate in every day. There's my vow. You can also have a situation in which I baked strawberry cakes previously. From this point forward, I'm going to bake you vanilla cakes. Same thing. You're letting go of a, you're letting go of that previous behavior and you're starting something new. And so this shaving or trimming the hair short, let's go of something previous, start something new. We are definitely not talking about a Nazarite vow. That's not what this is about. I've already demonstrated that for you. But there is an association between trimming or shaving your hair and moving forward with something new, cutting off the old. There's another context in which people would shave their heads, and this was in grief and mourning. And so there's something that God talks about, like he talks about using a razor to shave the heads and facial hair and private parts of Jerusalem, 
of this church. And he talks about it within the context of punishment, that he's going to bring the king of Assyria and he's going to shave his people. Now, I understand this from the perspective of he's going to shave him down a third and a third and a third and a third. You know that language if you've read Revelation or Ezekiel, where he says, I'm going to take, I, I'm going to, I'm going to put a third to the sword, a third to this, a third to that, and then of that third, and then of that third. And so he's shaving them down in size. But there's also this symbolism that he's previously established in which shaving that hair also represents letting go of the old and doing a new thing. And so in the context of Ezekiel, he does talk about a certain number of those who are in spiritual Jerusalem who are actually going to be brought out and their conduct is going to change. And we're going to be consoled when we see the conduct of those he put through the, through the fire, through his wrath. And so again, there is a, con a context of, as an individual, having the old shaved off of you and starting something new. God is creating something new and he's turning into something new. The reason I mention that context is because I believe that, because we know actually, not just I believe, but we know in the Old Testament that a lot of the behaviors that were established are, were, if, if not all of them, were established in order for us to understand certain things in their fulfillment in the New Covenant and in the New Testament. So it might seem like kind of a weird thing or a random or arbitrary thing for God to, you know, associate a, a vow or doing something new with shaving you or shearing you. But he's using a physical representation in order to help you to understand a spiritual representation of something new happening inside of you. Now, when you're made a new creation, do you turn into something new? Yeah, you do. I mean, your behaviors and your life and the way you think and the way that you see life and the way that you see, you know, the things that God talked about in the Bible should be entirely different. And if it's not, nothing has changed. You don't just pop out of water and you're a new creation like I was told in counterfeit Christianity. You have to become a new creation. And the way that you know that is that you look back and you go, wow, like the, the place that God has taken me, I don't think the same way. I don't behave the same way. I don't have the same life. If that's not happening, how can you call yourself a new creation? That's bizarre. And you know what's even more bizarre is that people go around saying this. I'm reborn. I'm a new creation. I'm saved, saved, saved. And they're still, I mean, the pe like the people who tried to get me baptized. I was just their project. But these people were still having premarital sex, going out drinking with each other. I mean, it's like that that is not my life. It was my life at one time. But when I became a new creation, that was not my life. And if I ever go back to it, it's because I fell. It's not because you can call that Christian. You can't call that Christian. Okay, so I hope that this has um, clarified the association and what might have been meant by that in the absence of there being anything formally written in the law that is accessible to us. We are not going to add to the scroll and say, oh, Paul did this because this was required in this, this way and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It just simply tells us that there was an association between shearing or shaving your head and a vow. Please discern this message with God.